but it actually works well. I, I wanted to slow down, as I mentioned, even though verses 1 through 10 is one section, and what we're doing this morning is two sections, I, I actually wanted to slow down uh, last week and, and devote an entire sermon to verses 7 to 10, because that instruction on how to stay on the path to humility, to, to receive a greater grace, was so important that we look at that in detail. And it also helps that in verses 11 to 17, even though these are two different um, sections, they, they do fit together quite well because both of them, though they are making dif- different points, do demonstrate or show us uh, another evidence of arrogance. And so I titled this Evidences of Arrogance. Evidences of Arrogance or Displays of Arrogance because as you look at these verses, James is going to describe, and in, <clears throat> in kind of in opposition to what he's described before about what humility looks like, he's going to describe Uh, some arrogance and some manifestations of it that he's even seen or heard about in his audience as he's writing this letter to them. So let's just begin and let's just follow along as I read verses 11 to 17. James writes, Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now, verse 11 begins with a very simple command, and then he goes on to discuss the problem of uh, slander, or even better, because slander is probably a little too narrow for the word that James uses here, simply speaking against. And so the NES does a great job of just bringing out a broader term than, than slander. It really is speaking against a brother. Um, speaking against a brother. So if we think of slander, if we think of judgment, it's judging a brother, slandering a brother, holding him to a standard that God has not held him to. And that becomes the, the topic here in verses 11 to 12. In verses 13 to 17, he turns and he starts talking about something else Entirely. Namely, he starts talking about what mani- a manifestation of arrogance that would pertain to God's providence, even particularly making certain plans about the future when you couldn't possibly know the future. What ties these two together is both of these are describing evidences or displays of arrogance. And so the first two, and there's, there's five of them in, in, in verses 11 to 17, the first two work together in tandem to, in such, such a cohesive fashion that I really couldn't separate them out. So number one is speaking against a brother. Number two is judging God's law. And James puts those two together as equals. He could put an equal sign between the two of them. And they are both discussed in verses 11 and 12. So we're really going to discuss these first two displays of arrogance at the same time. Speaking against a brother and judging God's law. Notice what James says. He actually commands us, do not speak against one another, brethren. That's a command. That's an obligation. And he's describing the fact that this speaking against a brother is a display of arrogance. It's a display of pride. It's a display of wisdom from below. And so if you're, if you're speaking against a brother, if you're, if you're judging him, then that's a, that's a mark of arrogance. And God is not on your side. He's opposed to you if you hold a brother to a standard that God is not holding him to. Notice how he explains it. The the guts of verse 11 kind of give us this equal sign between 
speaking against a brother and judging God's law. Because if you speak against a brother, you are judging a brother. If you are speaking against God's law, you are judging God's law. And so notice what he does. Verse 11, he who speaks against a brother or judges his brother. So the object of both of those verbs is a brother, speaking against or judging. And the person who does that, he speaks against the law and judges the law. The object of both of those verbs is the law, God's revelation of his righteous character. And so speaking against a brother, judging a brother equals speaking against God's law, judging God's law. I mean, this is a theological reality that we have got to get our minds around. This has to un undergird how we think about our evaluation of pride and humility. When you speak against a brother, if you speak evil against your brother, you are putting yourself in the position of God. This is why this is so arrogant. James' point in verse 11b yields a devastating theology about slander and judging. And, I'll, and I'm going to use the slander word not because it's broad enough for, for James's word, but it does have the, like the, the negative connotation that, that it should have in this verse. If you judge or slander a brother, you judge or slander God's law. So think about our, the nature of how we speak and think about a brother or sister in Christ. There's really two categories of critical comments or critical thoughts. Number one, you have those that are biblically valid and discerning, and these would be godly concerns that would be necessary to actually bring to a neighbor um, if they are living under the indictment of God's word. The other category of a critical thought or a critical speech would be those which are biblically invalid. They are demonstrated to be personally held opinions or expectations or personal standards. The first category of concerns, the ones that are biblically valid, those are the ones that uh, need to be brought lovingly so that a brother or sister can can receive the benefit and, and, and correction of God's word. But only the, the, the second type of critical thoughts would be included in the category of slander or judgment. Let me do this. I wanted to list out kind of in um, a Martin Lloyd-Jones fashion what he is not saying and then what he is saying. What is James not saying? James is not saying here... He's not saying that horizontal assessments cannot be biblically accurate. He's not saying that an assessment of a brother or sister could, can never be biblically accurate. That's, just, that's not at all what he's saying. And of course, we know that that's not true because Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth to one another in love, NAS says. Um, Paul literally, I, I think, as far as I remember, he creates a verb. He, he takes the noun truth, turns it into a verb. And so you could probably even translate that, truthing one another in love. So get busy truthing one another in love. And so when you speak truth in love, and the, and the goal is a, a God-honoring, loving, edifying intention, well, then when we speak truth to one another and we care for one another in that fashion, that's actually uh, possible. Obeying Ephesians 4.15 is possible. James is not saying such a thing is, is impossible. He's not saying that we can't make those horizontal assessments. He's also not saying that speaking critically to a brother is unloving. Uh, look at Leviticus 19 for a second. In fact, God's word makes it very clear that um, love requires rebuke. Leviticus 19, and this becomes a foundation for the horizontal aspect of the law. Leviticus 19, 17. Remember, remember this passage. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You must surely reprove your neighbor. And I think it might be, might be King James says, in, in, instead, rebuke him. So don't hate him. Instead, rebuke him. So like the opposite of hating your neighbor would be to actually rebuke him if he's in, in error from truth, if he's in violation of truth, if he's not following God's word. To love him would be to rebuke him. To hate him would be to say nothing. Nothing. 
So this is a very helpful uh, passage about what it means to, to love a neighbor. In, but you shall not incur sin because of him. And so the, the rebuke is, is necessary. Verse 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So God is Yahweh. You need to get busy loving your neighbor. Don't hate him. Instead, reprove him. Make sure you love him. So James is not saying that speaking critically to a brother is unloving. He's not saying that horizontal assessments can't be biblically accurate. He's also not saying, let me give you one more famous one, he's not saying that a brother cannot be the means of change in the life of another brother. And let's look at Jesus' own words in Matthew 7. And again, this is, these are all familiar passages to you, I'm sure, on, on how we use our words to benefit each other in the body of Christ. Christ is talking about a true kingdom citizen and how he relates to his brother. And the, 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 the sermon is, is constructed throughout the body of this sermon with a negative and then a positive. And so the negative comes in verse 1 of chapter 7. I mean, those are all the, all the topics that he deals with. He does a negative and a positive. Don't do this, but do this. So chapter 7, when he turns to, he turns from kind of a vertical relationship in chapter 6 with how um, we relate to God. Now he's talking about relationship to our neighbor in chapter 7. Verse 1, do not judge so that you will not be judged. Okay, and that's probably one of the most mis- misunderstood, misquoted verses in all of Scripture. Maybe second only to, uh, I can do all things through Christ. If you get into the sports world, this might be right up there. This probably surpasses that in the social settings. Don't judge. And sometimes what that means as people use that phrase is mean, it might mean or it might be intended to mean don't say anything critical. Or you couldn't possibly be helping to say something to have to have a, a critical thought. And that's certainly not what he's saying. What is he saying? Jesus actually explains what he means by not judging. And then it says in verse 2, For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And it's very important to remember that in chapter 7, verse 1, he's transitioning to love for the neighbor. In fact, that, that kinda, he kind of concludes the discussion from 7.1 all the way through 7.12. He concludes this in this way, verse 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. He summarizes the relationship you would have with your brother to say, love them the way you want to be loved, treat them the way you want to be treated. And so when he starts by saying, in the same way that you judge, you're going to be judged, he's not talking about God changing his standard of judgment as if God has some sort of unjust scale. He's talking about horizontally, if you hold somebody to an arbitrary standard, they're going to turn right around and hold you to an arbitrary standard. And so this is a, horizontally, this is just toxic. It just ruins relationships in the body of Christ. In the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured back to you. So just, just go ahead and start imposing personal standards on, on people in the church and see how they respond. I'm just kidding. That's, not a, that's, not a, that's just a hypothetical, right? You, you, you take that with a grain of salt. You're like, oh, okay, good. This is what he told me. He told me to make sure I do this. No, don't do that, because that's obviously what he's prohibiting here. If I were to hold somebody to an arbitrary standard, it's just natural that they would hold me to, this, to a different arbitrary standard. Oh, well, you're gonna, that's your opinion? Okay, well, I'm going to hold you to my opinion. Jesus explains, why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't take the log out of your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? The point is, is that when I'm judging someone, again, judgment is being condemned here, not rebuke, correction, speaking truth in love. Judgment, again, the world's going to use the word judgment for anything critical. Jesus is talking about making a personal judgment. What's condemned is if any one of us were to make a judgment against someone else. The point is, is that that judgment is coming from self. 
If we're holding somebody else to a standard of righteousness that's been revealed in God's word, and that person professes to love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, well, then to bring the standard of God's righteousness to a, to a professing brother or sister in the Lord, that's actually loving. That's not judgment. That's, that's God's judgment. That's not me being judgmental. That's God's judgment. So we're just being faithful. What's being condemned here is for me to think that my standard is better than yours? God's. My standard is better than God's. And so I bring a personal assessment, a personal standard, a personal measure, a personal opinion or preference or expectation, and then impose it on you? Mm. That is arrogant. And that's a much worse sin than whatever I might have seen in someone else's life that might have been wrong according to God's word. Because now I've put myself in the position of God and I'm going to hold them to a subjective standard. So what's the corollary opposite? How do you avoid that? Verse 5, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. The point isn't that we can't horizontally be a means of grace in God's gracious provision in the church to have life on life and to share life with one another where we can be speaking truth and actually minister to one another and be a benefit spiritually. That's obviously what happens throughout Scripture in all of the plural commands in the New Testament. That's just assumed in all those plural commands. That's necessary. What the answer here is, is getting rid of the log. Again, it's that beam word, and it's like the speck of dust versus, you know, a, a a garage door header. <laughs> he uses a word that's so exaggerated. You're like, how do you get a garage door header inside your eye? That's really painful. Um, yesterday, I, we were uh, doing some, getting some grapefruit, um, and uh, a little chunk of, from a branch came flying into my eye, and it was like, you know, my eye just starts watering up, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I got it out, and I thought I, I thought I just washed it out because I was hosing it off with the garden hose. You know, my eyes just like, it's just flushing. I'm like, I looked, I was, looked like I was crying like a baby. And then, like, and two hours later, we're driving somewhere, and I, I always wipe my face, and then there's this little chunk right there on my, on my finger. I'm like, man, look at that. And so we were looking at that, and I was marveling at how, how big this thing was. I mean, it's still, like, it's like the size of about, like, six average splinters combined. That's about all it was. And it just, it felt like a two-by-four. But Jesus is obviously using the exaggeration to say, this is so absurd that when you have a, something like that massive in your eye that you could even see clearly— You've got to get rid of that kind of arrogance that you would bring personal judgments against a brother. You've got to get rid of that so that you can actually see clearly and actually be a benefit to your, to your brother and bring a right judgment, God's judgment. And so that's, it's obvious that James is not violating any of these passages. He's not saying that you can't be accurate in a horizontal assessment, that you, that, uh, a critical um, Speaking critically is, is um, unloving. He's, he's not saying that a brother can't be a means of change. What is James saying? Let's go back to James. So James chapter 4, he says in verse 11, he who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. So what you are doing is you are actually saying, if you judge someone, again, that doesn't mean bringing truth to bear. It means making a personal judgment. That means if I'm going to bring a criticism against your life, and we're going to talk about what this could be based on. It could be based on opinion. It could be based on how I've applied passages. It could be based on preference. It could be based on my, my own experience or circumstance. It could be based on all sorts of subjective things. If I bring that judgment against you and I speak against you because you're different than me in one of these gray areas, that means I'm speaking against God's law, I'm judging God's law because I'm saying God's law is not enough. It hasn't gone far enough or it stopped short, or it's gone too far, or wherever I've created this little judgment line or this standard of measurement that I'm throwing out there, God's word has is, is fallen off on one side versus the other, and mine is correct. And suddenly you start realizing these, these horizontal 
The manifestations of pride are so gross because they are vertical. It's a pride against God. So what James is saying, number one, he's saying that uh, assessments of a brother that go beyond God's word is arrogance. Number two, he's saying that assessments of a brother that stops short of God's word is arrogance. Number three, he's saying that assessments based on personal opinions, and circumstantial applications, preferences, personal choices, freedoms, liberties, personality, tastes, likes, dislikes, that is arrogance. Sometimes we make judgments based on what we think is the scripture. Because we have a chapter and a verse, and we have a passage that we studied, and it led us to a particular application, and then somebody else applies it differently, and we say, oh, you, my friend, are failing to obey this passage because I applied it this way, and you're not applying it this way. And that's how arrogant to imagine that um, we would all apply it the same way, nor that the Spirit would, should be convicting us all to apply it the same way. You know, there's some obvious examples of this. I'm sure you, would be, you could probably list out several examples you know, it's, um, classic examples would be like when you, you preach a passage like Ephesians 5 on marriage and, oh, you got to apply this thing. And so you hear somebody say, oh, well, man, the way to apply this is you, you know, you go, men, you go home after thinking about your relationship with your wife, you go home and you write her a note, you give her a box of chocolates and you take her on a trip. And, you know, then the guy's sitting there thinking like, okay, I did all that. And his wife's like, I can't stand chocolate. I'm allergic to it. And why do we want to go on a trip? I want to stay home and work in the backyard. And you start, it's just like, oh, that, that didn't work. And it's just a very obvious example because it's so, so far distant from the guts of the passage. And of course, dying to self and sacrificing might mean doing something that you don't want. It, it does mean doing something that you might not prefer in order to serve a spouse but it has nothing to do with these cheap, trite little applications. And so often, the way truth has benefited us, we might even have a proper application for our life and then think that somebody else who doesn't apply it that way is, is sinning or is in violation of God's word. That's just arrogance. Think about what Paul does. I was thinking about this very principle in James 4.11, and I was reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you know, Paul, even when he applies truth in a very specific way, he applies the truth to the congregation at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 8, particularly about liberties. But notice what he does. Let's, let's turn here for a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, notice what he does. He doesn't just sit there and say, hey, here's what you do. With food sacrifice to idols, make sure you do this, make sure you don't do this. I mean, he does get there. He gets very specific from chapters 8 to chapters 10. Those three chapters of 1 Corinthians lay out what Corinth needs to do with this issue of food sacrifice to idols. And it's not a yes or no. It's circumstantially determined by what promotes the kingdom, depending on who they're ministering to. But if he went straight at the application without getting to the, the, the foundational principle, the foundational truth, this instruction would be completely useless. It would, just be, it would only be as good as the exact same circumstance would warrant. But he starts... With the principle, so notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, now concerning things sacrificed to idols. Now that's the specific. The, they wrote to him with some questions and he starts to tackle those issues and answer them uh, con concerning um, purity in marriage and concerning uh, giving and support for the church on, and bringing an offering on, on the Lord's day. Now concerning the spiritual gifts. And so he's dealing with about five or six issues that they've written to him about starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, going all the way through chapter 16. This one, he starts with, let me just tackle this issue you wrote about, about food sacrifice to idols. He reminds them not of some sort of obscure application that's, that's of limited value. He goes all the way back. He drives down theological steel and goes deep and gives them a theological foundation on how to apply it. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Now, that's a very helpful principle because rather than just launching the application, he says, let's start with this principle, which is knowledge makes arrogant, Knowledge puffs up, love edifies. That's the issue. That's the principle. That's a theological 
axiom. And we can take that and we can apply it in all sorts of different situations and to, in order to make sure that we are loving the body of Christ, that we are pleasing uh, the Lord in, in, our, in our lives. And then he goes on to say, if anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, now in verse 4, he turns a corner and starts to apply that principle that starts in 1b and goes all the way through verse 3. And he says, therefore, concerning the things of the eating of things, sacrifice to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. And he goes on to talk about the fact that you might be theologically aware, you might have knowledge to know that these idols that you are serving, they are no gods at all. And he goes on to explain that. And so somebody who knows these are not gods at all, they're either demons or they're man-made ideas, and you, you have this theological knowledge, you can actually eat food sacrificed to idols and not violate your conscience, and that's fine. So you got a discounted T-bone, great. You saved on the grocery budget, fine. No big deal. That's just not the issue. The issue is these liberties need to be used or not used as it promotes the kingdom. So then he introduces the idea of another believer who does not have that theological knowledge, who is just recently coming out of such confusion and thinking, I can't even possibly eat that without sinning against the Lord who saved me. Well, then you just push forward in your liberties to save money on a, save a buck on a steak, and you cause your fellow believer to sin? That's how knowledge has just puffed you up, and you've actually torn down a brother. Love edifies. And so he takes that principle and starts applying it all the way through chapters 8, 9, and 10. And so it's actually really a helpful example, just thinking about how Paul does that. These, when it comes to how we live the Christian life and how we think about how the decisions that we make, we've got to remember, look, circumstances vary, Families vary, um, personalities vary, and of course there are black and whites. Black and whites don't change. If you violate a black and white, you're, you're, you're not pleasing to the Lord. But the question then becomes, sometimes we start to get confused about our particular application of a black and white, and we start thinking that the application is just as black and white as the principle behind it. And then at that point, we start holding brothers and sisters to the same application. Well, now we are arrogant saying, well, God... God didn't make the principle specific enough because I applied it this way in this particular context and here's the, here's the general principle, but I've, I've dialed it down all the way to this point of godliness. And if you don't dial it down this way, then boy, you just haven't arrived. And how arrogant. Do we actually think that God giving his, his principles in the way that he's given them is not the best? Do we actually think that we applying them more narrowly or more broadly is an improvement on the principle that he gave? When sometimes he just gives us the principle so that we have the freedom and the benefit of actually making a decision in a particular context, we might turn around 30 seconds later and make the exact opposite decision, both of them motivated by the spiritual benefit of the person we were ministering to. Do we not think that that's a better way? We just don't want to have to think about it. We don't have to sacrifice. We just want to have a quick answer. We don't have to have, rely on the word, Lord for wisdom. And so then we canonize one particular application and hold everybody to that standard. James says, that's arrogant. Oof. Wow. There was a particular parenting curriculum that uh, was very popular um, uh, when, uh, when I was growing up, it was very popular at the church where my, where my wife grew up. And uh, it was interesting that this curriculum, it was written by, by a, a man who ended up being a false teacher and was disciplined out of the church, but it had some biblical principles, it had some unbiblical principles. It was kind of a, a mix mash of, of both. And, um, you know, it had, had just a lot, of, a lot of it was just kind of how-to, very basic practical things, practical suggestions for parenting. And so, um, it was interesting that uh, it was kind of an over-realized application. And so some parents took that curriculum and they practiced it and they implemented it from when their children were young. And I had a seminary professor who, well, who was, who was uh, a, an elder in that church uh, for 20 years. And he told me in seminary class, he was describing a marriage and family class, he said, 
I remember watching this, this generation of parents with this kind of over-realized application of how you parent and then watching them come into the teenage years and then watching some of their teenagers walk away from the Lord or not follow after the Lord. And it was almost like, hey, we did the program. We want our money back. And you just you, you kind of get this idea that it's like, hey, we, we've applied this and why aren't our children walking with the Lord? Of course, other parents, they weren't, they weren't arrogant. They were just using it as a helpful curriculum, and they were actually saved from some of the core errors because they actually believed the truth and that sort of thing. But inevitably, that, that's, that's some of the effects of this kind of arrogance. And in case you're at all confused about where some of this could apply, let me just give you some examples. This is going to read like a bullet point list of uh, toxic conversations that some of us just try to avoid. We make decision X versus decision Y in areas like medicine, vaccination, allowable sicknesses that are tolerable for my children to be around your children, or decision X versus Y in the areas of education, or decision X versus Y in the area of parenting, and um, how much risk is tolerable, how much freedom is given at various ages or various levels of responsibilities, how quickly do we let that rope out, and one parent of teenagers say this far, another parent of teenagers say that far, and no farther, no less, no more. How we spend our money. You know, I remember, I remember uh, in, uh, one young man uh, being concerned when he saw a, an elder in the church who had bought a new car. You know, he was a college student who took great pride in his, you know, 30-year-old vehicle that was hanging together with bailing wire or whatever. And, uh, you know, and I can just say, hey, that, that's, that's sweet to be able to thank the Lord and trust the Lord with whatever he's, he's providing. But if a guy has the means to buy a car that you don't have to have in the shop every week, why would you begrudge that? I mean, you wouldn't want to presume that he made that decision because he's trying to have some sort of worldly motive. Maybe that was actually the wisest use of his money. Maybe he has no idea how to turn a, a socket, and he says, this is the best use of my money, so I can actually be more devoted to serve in the church. If he has the resources, great. If you don't have them, don't hold it against him, but don't judge. And so sometimes we have differences in how we would spend money or decisions we would make on any of those issues. And of course, these decisions affect biblical issues pertaining to, your, to fulfilling your obligations in the body of Christ. Let me read to you, before we move on to the verses 13 and 14, let me read to you Romans 14. And Smed, Smed taught this uh, late last year, or maybe even late 2000, or early last year, maybe late 2020. Remember what, what uh, Paul says in Romans 14. He summarizes several areas of conscience and opinion and preference, including diet or food, holidays to be observed, Food and drink, all of these issues are, are liberties. And so verse 7, Paul says this, For not one of us lives for himself, not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. And this is where the arrogance comes from. The arrogance comes from thinking that if I do think something's right and I make this application, then somebody else who doesn't, I'm going to view them with contempt. Or they view it as right and I've stopped short of it and I'm going to start judging them. And God hasn't judged them. They're totally within God's revealed will and I just made a different decision. Then why in the world would I start making judgments? That's arrogant. Verse 11, for as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. We actually do that when we start holding standards that are personal. Think about that, that quote there in verse 11. Every knee shall bow to me. That's God speaking. And it's appropriate to say, if, I was going, if I'm going to judge a brother, I'm actually, I actually believe to some degree, theologically, I believe every knee should bow to me, lowercase m. Wow, that's arrogant. 
And so in James 4, James is making the point, this is, there's an equal sign between judging a brother and speaking against him and judging the law and speaking against God. Verse 12, there's only one lawgiver. I'm sorry, I'm back in James, James 4. So the very next verse, James says, therefore, there's, there's, there's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? And it sounds just like Romans 14 who are we to judge one another? We belong to the Lord. And so we can see that theologically, this is an evidence of arrogance. Speaking against a brother, we're judging a brother where God has not. Well, I quickly want to look at these last few verses. In verses 13 to 17, James transitions, and he turns from what is a clear manifestation of arrogance uh, a clear manifestation of wisdom from below, a clear manifestation of pride. So when it comes to getting a greater grace, the person who's judging his brother, he is, he's not getting a greater grace. He's putting himself in a position where he's going to be at odds with God. He's going to receive God's um, hostility if he lives there. And he's certainly going to be chastened if, he's, uh, if he has saving faith. But now in verse 13, he transitions to a manifestation of arrogance that speaks about an ignorance or arrogance uh, about God's providence. Verse 13, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. So the point here is he's saying, Look, you need to look at your life, and some of you are making plans for the future, and you are so arrogant that you know what you're going to do. This is what I'm aiming at. This is what I'm going to do. And in our culture, in our society of self-actualization, I mean, we are, we are told this in every venue possible. You've got to make up your mind. You've got to be determined. You've got to be resolute. you just got to put your mind to it, and you, you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, well, that's a lie from hell. No, God's on the throne of the universe. You cannot do whatever you want to do. God rules this, the heavens and the earth. And so James just points out that's going to be a common, common way that people think. Hey, tomorrow, today, tomorrow, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go over here. We're going to make a profit. It's going to be great. And he starts calling that out as arrogance because it is. And it actually sounds very, dare I say, a little too comfortable. Is that really just arrogance, what he just said, making that kind of firm plan? Are, are firm plans wrong? No, no, it's not that the firm plans are wrong. Notice in verse 14, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. It's not wrong to have a plan that you're committed to, uh, acknowledging, I don't even know if this is ever going to get off the ground. I don't know what the Lord's going to do. I don't know if he's going to prosper it. I don't even know if I'm going to be alive long enough to see this plan carried, carried to fruition. But here's my plan. Well, that's, that's not wrong. What's wrong is the certain plan that doesn't acknowledge the sovereignty of God. That's arrogant. As I was looking at verses 13 and 14, I, I, I realized that it's the certainty in your ignorance that's the arrogance being exposed. Certainty in your ignorance. That's the third manifestation, the third display of arrogance is certainty in your ignorance. I want to show you a, um, a, similar, a similar text. This came to mind. Uh, look at 1 Timothy for a second. 1 Timothy shows us another um, certainty in ignorance. But it's a little bit of a different context, and I thought it was a helpful parallel. Now, let's briefly look at verses, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Paul tells Timothy, who's ministering in Ephesus, he tells him, you know, that there are people in the church there who are speaking things that are outside of God's word. So they're not even, it's not even necessarily that they're teaching against God's word. They're just teaching outside of God's word. It's just not, it's not opposed to God's word necessarily. It's just other than God's word. And that's what he's warning against in verse um, 3. It's translated strange doctrine, and I would just say it's other doctrine. Other doctrine is, it doesn't really matter that it's strange. It's not that it's eccentric. It's just outside the Bible. And that's enough to say, why is that even being taught in the church? So verse 5, Paul says to Timothy, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. 
For some men, verse 6, strain from these things, the three things that motivate his loving instruction, they have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. These people are confidently making assertions, and they are actually theologically ignorant. They're making confident assertions where they are unaware. And so I thought that was an interesting, interesting indictment. These teachers are so desperate to be perceived as experts, but they don't even know exactly what they're teaching about. They're making confident assertions in the midst of their ignorance. And James, if we go back to James, he's making a point that, you know what, here's an area of arrogance that we often can fall prey to, arrogance, not so much a, a theological arrogance about, uh, about God's word, but more uh, an ignorance about providence, and we're, we might be arrogant in our it's something we're uncertain of. We don't even know the future. We don't even know what our life holds. We don't even know what tomorrow looks like. James says your life is a vapor. And so if you picture, maybe you made a cup of coffee this morning, and maybe you sat outside, and in the cool desert morning, you saw some steam off the cup of your coffee. And if not, you can picture it, right? How long did that last? I mean, when you see that steam just kind of whip up and it kind of curls around itself, the top layer of steam just disappears as soon as it reaches the temperature of the air around it, and it's instantly invisible. I mean, the video is not much different than the photograph. There is not much difference between the snapshot of a vapor and the video of a vapor. And that's our life. It's quick. And what arrogance that we would make plans without realizing the brevity of life and the God who sits on the throne. Proverbs 16, verse 1 says, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Man makes plans. <clears throat> we plan things out. We come up with a plan. We concoct a scheme. And that's appropriate. We should come up with a plan. We should come up with a scheme and say, Hey, this is a good way to go forward, and hopefully it's a good plan. Uh, but the arrogance would be to say, this is what I'm going to do. The arrogance would be to make a plan and to realize this might not even work. And in fact, whatever providence has determined is better than my plan. Certainty in our ignorance is a, is a sign of, of arrogance. Verse 15, he moves on to say what we ought to be thinking about. And my, the evidence of arrogance here, I'm just calling it theological amnesia. We forget something that we ought to be saying. So in verse 15, it's the positive. Instead, here's what you ought to be saying. If the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. If the Lord wills. If God has so desired, it will come to fruition. If it's God's desire, if it's his will, if it's according to his counsel, then it will stand. God rules and controls all things. There's nothing he doesn't know. There's nothing in reality that he doesn't know. There's nothing that's a contingency that he doesn't know. There's nothing hypothetical that he doesn't know. There's nothing that could not have come into reality that didn't come into reality that he also doesn't know. We know that because Matthew 11 says so. He even says to Chorazin and Bethsaida, woe to you. If the miracles that had been performed in you had been performed in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented long ago, would have repented. God knows Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented if they had experienced the kind of revelation that Bethsaida and Chorazin benefited from in Christ's earthly ministry. And he never gave them that kind of revelation. God even knows contingencies. There's nothing he doesn't know. And we add to that kind of knowledge that God does whatever he wants. Psalm 103, 19, his sovereignty is seated in the heavens. Psalm 135, verses 5 and 6, God is seated in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases in the earth and the sky and the sea and all the deeps. Isaiah 14, 27, God has extended his hand. Who can turn it back? Ephesians 1.11, he works all things according to the counsel, singular counsel of his will. He's worked out one plan, 
according to his will, one plan. And this is it. Whatever happens is his plan. We, we, might, we know his moral will about the future. We don't know his providential will. He's worked out one plan. And it is according to the counsel of his will, all reality. And so here we are, and if we are planning ahead without recognition that I'm not in control, that's arrogant. That's theological arrogance. Now, I do want to make a comment here. Verse 15, you know, it says, if the Lord wills. And, um, you know, you, you, might, you might have heard somebody say, or maybe you have a habit of saying, hey, Lord willing. And, you know, sometimes we might think, well, how, how do we, what, what's James actually calling us to here in verse 15? Well, what James is calling us to is actually calling us to a heart that recognizes the Lord's sovereign will in all of our plans and in all of our activities, in all of our business, in all of our exchanges, in all of our schemes that we might concoct. Now, sometimes saying Lord will is Lord willing is actually a helpful way to remind us of that theological truth. And no, you know, you would have to know that if you say that. And is that actually just kind of a habitual catchphrase that we say in a Christian colloquialism? Or is that actually a theological reminder? And if it's a theological reminder, that's great. But he's, it's not an issue of necessarily whether we say it. It's an issue, is that in our heart? Is that actually our conviction? The last one comes in verse, the last uh, manifestation of arrogance comes in verses 16 and 17, and that's, Boasting in our arrogance. Boasting in our arrogance. What's James getting at here? Let's look at verse 16. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Now, in that translation there, I'm reading the NES, the footnote for arrogance is pretensions, and that's excellent because it's plural. And so I would actually say, just go ahead and underline that, that, that marginal note if you have an NAS. Um, boasting in your pretensions the word boast is the, the verb that means to take pride in something, um, to boast glory, pride oneself, to brag even. Uh, you can boast about something. Uh, it's something that you're pr- proud of, you love talking about. It's that you love highlighting because it's something that you're very fond of. And so you take great delight in highlighting it. And what is it that James' audience is highlighting that's very fond of? They love promoting their pretensions. They're boasting in their pretensions. Uh, The word translated arrogance in the NAS is the plural pretensions. Pretension or arrogance in word and deed. But now you are boasting in your pretensions. You're actually quite fond of a plan that you came up with that could be obsolete one second after you planned it. In your arrogance. And that would be tragic. It would be tragic not to have humbled yourself to receive a greater grace. Verse 17 then says, therefore, and the therefore here, I believe, is going to function well as a concluding statement. It's kind of like coming to a logical conclusion. So therefore, let me, let me go ahead and make a, a statement that's, that's the, the conclusion we should arrive at. Here it is. To the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him... It is sin. This is like saying, now that I've pointed out the matter to you, you have no excuse. So if in your horizontal relationships, you speak against a brother or you judge a brother, you're speaking against God's law, you're judging God's law. If in your plans, you are certain about something you're ignorant of, or you have theological amnesia of who rules on the throne of heaven and who knows all things and works all things according to his, his singular plan, then you are boasting in your pretensions. You're boasting in your pride. You're very fond of your ability to come up with a plan when you couldn't even possibly know what God is doing. If you know God is sovereign, it's sin for you to plan with a certainty about the future. Again, it's not sinful to to plan. It's sinful to plan with a certainty about the future that you couldn't possibly know. If you know that God's law is righteous and loving, it's sin for you to hold your brother to a personal standard. So in contrast to this theological amnesia that we, we see here in verses 13 to 17, 
The arrogance here is that all of these, um, these, these the, the theology, these theological truths are basically stolen from God's domain and they're placed in the domain of self. God gave a righteous standard that's perfect. No, 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 my standard is righteous and perfect. God's law is the perfect display of his righteousness. No, 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 I have a standard that's the perfect display of righteousness. God's sovereign. No, I'm sovereign. God knows all. No, I know all. And so this is a kind of pride that would put you at odds with God. And here's the theological picture that we ought to have in our minds when we presume against a brother, when we hold him to a standard that God does not, and when we plan with confidence rather than leaving our plans in the hands of a sovereign God to do as he pleases. Picture God sitting on the throne of the heavens and the earth. And we're standing on the earth that he created. And he created us. He created the dirt that we're standing on. And then we're extending our hand, shaking our fist at God in our arrogance, shaking a fist that he, by the way, is sustaining at the subatomic level by the word of his power. And we're sitting there exerting all of this effort theologically trying to put ourselves on the throne instead of God. I think that picture was a help to me as I was just picturing what what I was reading in verses 11 to 17, because there are times where you can read what happens here in verses 11 to 17 and kind of be a little bit, you know, numb to it, almost like, well, yeah, that's okay. I can see that there's some problems here. Is it really that bad? And James is saying, yeah, it's that bad. Because that would be, that would be the pride that would prevent you from receiving a greater grace. And that's what God, that's what James wants for us. And that's what, of course, God wants for us. So as we look at, as we kind of finish this series, um, I'm just super grateful for the clarity of James. And as you knew before we started this series, it's just, James is so punchy, isn't it? Just so convicting at every turn. Just like, just gets right, right in at the heart level of motive. And um, my prayer is, is that this would become a help for all of us to grow and to have clarity about a profession of faith. And I just want to pray, as, as we've talked about before, it's not so much my job to try to isolate application to one audience versus another audience. If you've been hearing this series and you've been in these equipping hours and you've been thinking about what does a test of a saving faith look like, if, if you're failing at every test, like if, if, this, if the failure test is, it describes your life, then benefit from that. Thank the Lord right now for exposing your faith as being illegitimate. But if it's, if it's showing you, wow, there is, there's, there's fruit here. There's, there's a living faith and it's actually producing change. And, and I can see on the, on the positive side of that test, I see that in my life. But at the, at the nuanced level, I, I actually still see manifestations of this wisdom from below or manifestations of pride that would actually hinder me from getting a greater grace. Then thank the Lord for that kind of clarity as well and humble yourself so that you can receive a greater grace. And so I'll, the spirit is sufficient to apply that to, to all of us. For, Lord, we just thank you for James 3 and 4. And I want to pray for everyone here. For everyone who is in you, I pray that it would be just food for their soul. And Lord, your spirit knows how to minister to all of us, your children, with profound clarity and with profound application. And Lord, I also want to pray for everyone who is not your child. Maybe if they thought they were, maybe they know they're not. It wouldn't matter, Lord, if they fail these tests. Now they know that you're, they're not. And um, so, Lord, I pray for them that the same would be true, that your spirit would bring conviction for the first time. And uh, Lord, thank you so much for giving us clarity about what saving faith produces and what it looks like. And the longer we live, the longer we want to just continue to see proof of life, signs of a saving faith, that our faith would be tested and not found wanting, but be proven to be supernatural. And the longer we live and we don't produce fruit, the more we would doubt, rightly doubt our salvation. And the more we live and see fruit, the more we can thank you for a salvation that we could never take credit for. So thank you so much for showing us the path to a greater grace, by showing us what, what humility looks like, and by showing us marks of pride. And help us to uh, benefit from this instruction. In your name we pray. Amen.